How many do you have, uh, Costa? I Sorry? The 79, I think. So I'm getting it 79 registered on okay. Zoom. So I'm and, getting it now on YouTube. And uh, uh, would you will mute uh, us or uh, will we do it ourselves? Yeah, you can mute it. You can mute it now for a minute. Yes. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kostas uh, Karadinis, and I'm uh, right now in Copenhagen. Although in the registration you see that uh, I'm in Alper, in Alper, Sweden. And I think as I discovered, uh, almost half of our panel is not in, uh, in, the, in the places that I have uh, 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 registered them. Um, I, I think we will try to get this uh, straight in, in a minute. So the, the idea today is that we're going to, to try to take a, a look at uh, what the world agriculture and food is going to be like in, in the future after the, the, the pandemic. And um, I know that there are a lot of um, a, a lot of people are looking at this, uh, and uh, I don't think anybody has a, an absolutely clear picture of what happened and what what it will look like in the future. But I think uh, we have an excellent panel here uh, to discuss this. And um, just uh, just to give us a, a little bit of a perspective of, of whether we are at now. Uh, the pandemic has started uh, in January, uh, it entered this year. So far, I was just looking at the figures, there are 5.7 million people that are registered that have been uh, infected, uh, 353,000 deaths, um, 2.4 million people have uh, recovered, but still there are about 2.9 million cases uh, active uh, today, and 53% of them are, uh, are are in critical condition. So today we're going to talk about uh, an industry um, that it is, uh, according to to many uh, views, it has been a l less affected than others um, um, in the other industries directly. Uh, although it is a very uh, important industry because. Uh, and I'm talking about agriculture and food because uh, agriculture is uh, is uh, is an industry that is producing about eight trillion dollars a year, or 10% of the global GDP. It employs more than 1.5 million people, and um, it is feeding. It, it's an industry that everybody in the planet comes uh, in touch with every day. Uh, because uh, because of our food and this uh, this industry has managed to serve almost everybody uh, for almost every day of the year and I say almost because unfortunately still the industry has not um, the uh, the still there is um, about um, 135 million people that are uh, suffering that are not finding food every day. And this number is increasing. And uh, I think the, at least that's what we hear and the, we, we will hear more today is that uh, this number is going to be higher this uh, year because of the pandemic. And uh, I, I will not go into more because we have uh, this excellent panel here to discuss these issues. And I will just go briefly and introduce them to you in alphabetical order. We have uh, Tasus Hagiotis. Um, from the EU, 
Um, he's sitting, I think it's, I, I'm confident to say that he's sitting in uh, his home or the office in Brussels. Um, we have uh, Leon Jackson from the OECD, who I thought she was in Paris, but uh, just a few minutes ago, I discovered that she's in, um, in, in Geneva. Um, and uh, also we have uh, Kostas Tamoulis, who was supposed to be in Rome, but uh, he's not. And, um, and he's going to tell us what he's uh, sitting right now. And we have also David Zilberman from Berkeley, California. And we have another panelist right on the right corner, as I see, which is uh, Kostas' dog. And uh, we'll see what we will hear from Kostas' dog. And he can explain why uh, this panelist uh, all of a sudden sneaked into my panel here. Um, but let me let me first uh, start with you, Kosta. And uh, if if uh, you 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 have been uh, a few years in the FAO, I think about three decades or something, uh, or am I wrong? And uh, you had a very good uh, view uh, all these years. Uh, you were looking at world agriculture, at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, and um, you you had uh, all these years looked at the gl at global agriculture with particular emphasis on developing countries but why don't you try to give us an overview of how the the world uh, and world agriculture came into this uh, crisis into this uh, coronavirus the, the pandemic how did the pandemic found uh, world agriculture um first of all um Am I muted or no? Uh, I can hear you. Good morning or good evening, whatever the case, whatever the case may be. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, uh, workshop. Um, I think those issues are extremely important. We um, tend to discuss the effects of the coronavirus of the COVID-19 from the short-term perspective. Um, however, um, I would like to take a little bit of a different view um, uh, to see if we were to rebuild the um, um, to, to, to rebuild the system, how would we do it differently? And so um, um, from that point of view, uh, I, I will take a, a longer a, a longer view rather than the short view that is usually um, uh, taken um, uh, up to now. Uh, let, let me just say that uh, even uh, before the COVID, we had about 120 million people um, uh, that were um, hungry in the world chronically. Uh, and, and, the, and also in terms of, um, in terms of the, um, acute food insecurity caused by different crises and emergencies. We had about um, 240 million people in need of food assistance, right? That was without the effects of the coronavirus. So I think the effects of the coronavirus are, um, are, 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 extremely, um, are extremely serious. Um, we will we'll talk about that, what is the estimates of the effects, etc. But before we, we do that, let's, let's, let's take a look at some of, the, um, um, some of the essentials regarding food systems. First of all, I want to give two key messages in my presentation, which is unfortunately very short uh, in terms of time given. Um, I think the COVID-19 brought an insult over injury to an already sick food system. Uh, and the second was the good news is that the old and the post COVID agendas for building better uh, food systems largely coincide. And so those are the, the three, um, the two key messages that I would like to give. Um, this paper is part of a, of a think piece, which is the first time I present it, um, put together by the three people that you see on your screen. And it's part of a food insecurity, resilience, sustainability and transformation project, which is an FAO EU partnerships running. But, uh, we, we don't see the paper. 
um, share your screen, please. You don't see the slides? No. No, we see you, and that's very nice, but... Uh, Just a second. Um... Do you see the slides? It's coming up now. Thank you. Um, now we see them. Just one second. I think I, there is, uh, we have a problem with this now. We, we can see it and we can hear you. No, you can't see them now. No, we can't. Um, uh, let me, try then to uh, maybe i'll play the slides and then i do i do the share uh, is that it maybe i mean what happens when you try to to share it doesn't work it, it kicks back just one second uh, soon they will come up just one second only mm -hmm. um Sorry about that. Um, it's Murphy's law. Um, Okay, I have made you, um, I have made it possible that you share the screen, Costa. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I can't be in Zoom. I can't find the Zoom part. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to start the slides now and to share the screen for you. Yeah, but the problem is I can't see the Zoom. Okay. Can everybody see the slides now? Just a second, just a second, Costas. Uh, just please uh, drop down the slides. I will do that. Okay. Can you see? Yeah, we can see the slides. You can see the slides? Can you see the slides? I, I can see the slides. Yeah? What yes, about everybody, the other? Everybody can see the slides, yes. Okay, and the, and the speaking notes or what? Yes. Just a second. I got to turn this into... Into just play it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, okay. Sorry about this. Uh, so, so the the first program is an FAO EU partnership. It runs in about thirty three countries um, that supports governments in policies on food systems and food security. So this paper is the first time we we present it. We want to sort of test drive it and see what kind of responses we get. But it looks at long term things. Um, let me first say that um, I, I'd like to start with uh, new positively, you know, and I think in the last decade, uh, the world has made um, significant progress in reducing hunger and improving undernourishment, hunger, um, also uh, it's reducing undernutrition as captured by the stunting of children. 
uh, different forms of it. Uh, we like to credit, sometimes we credit uh, all these successes to the food system. Of course, it's a combination of things uh, that go beyond the food systems. It has to do with overall growth, transformation, etc. So, but, but uh, I think the, the successes have been there. Now, um, we have also made successes in terms of uh, agricultural um, development. Um, cereals and yields have substantially increased, um, and the, in, including in the developing countries. Um, the world cereal yields have actually practically uh, quadrupled since the early 60s. Um, while in Africa, they have been just about doubled. Um, and better food and nutrition has resulted in better health and a higher life expectancy, um, resistance to increase resistance to disease, um, etc. And the uh, near eradication of diseases like uh, schizosomiasis, uh, reduction in malaria, etc. However, um, everything has its uh, price. And um, the successes um, has been, um, uh, the, they have not been for everybody. What you see in your picture here is um, the uh, presumed um, stylized facts regarding the prevalence of undernourishment on the horizontal um, axis and the prevalence of overweight on the uh, vertical axis, and supposedly the reduction in undernourishment, with, with, which is the, um, the um, red uh, curve, um, sh should be accompanied at some time with the reduction of overweight and obesity, right? Uh, However, this is, it has not been exactly the case. Uh, if you see some of the patterns, uh, you'll see that um, the reduction in, um, in uh, undernourishment has also been accompanied by the increase, sometimes vertical increases in, um, some, sometimes vertical increases in, um, of overweight and obesity, which leads to the um, non-communicable, uh, it's, it's part of the non-communicable diseases, um, in especially which, which are now exploding in the developing countries. So this is one of the negative impacts of, um, you know, the changes in food system. So instead of following a path uh, along the green dotted line, we have followed the path um, um, continuously on the red line. And so in some of the countries, um, this has been pretty steep. Like in Colombia, you have a huge increase in overweight, South Korea, Japan, um, you know, e Ethiopia, a little bit smoother, et cetera. But let me go on with the next slide, which is going to be a little video constructed um, um, now, what, what has been the effects of the agriculture and ongoing food system transformation? I go very quickly and I will stop at some important issues, which I think uh, you should keep in mind. No? Um, um, you see, um, so the rising increase in productivity has been associated with biodiversity loss, soil fertility loss, antimicrobial misuse, antibiotic misuse, antimicrobial, because we're feeding animals uh, for growth, not just for cure, antibiotic misuse for animals, again, uh, agrochemical misuse, habitat loss, climate change, and intensive livestock and aquaculture development. Now, some of those things are really important, and there are two paths which leads to the spread of, of uh, disease. Um, the first path is the fact that the uh, reduction in the um, um, that the reduction in um, the um, uh, number of species of uh, of, um, of foods that we eat 
um, has um, resulted in what we call a dysbiosis, that is um, the, the anomalies in the human mic microbiome, which they contribute um, to the um, uh, obesity, um, sorry, obesity and um, diet related NCD. So it's not only food intake that contributes to this, uh, but also um, the, um, the, the fact that the chemicals and also the, the reduction in the, in the species of, of foods that we eat that have been reduced drastically um, uh, result in this uh, uh, obesity and diet related NCDs. Now there is the other path which goes through the destruction of, um, of um, and the encroachment of habitats of um, as agriculture expands, um, the reduction in agrobiodiversity um, with um, uh, only 30 species providing 95% of food and energy needs and just five um, of them, rice, wheat, maize, millet and sorghum correspond to about 60% of the needs. Also, um, the, um, so there is a disturbance of the natural environments. Um, the, um, as I said before, the um, uh, animals, the, 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 um, uh, the overuse of chemicals, of, of chemicals and, and um, anti antimicrobials and antibiotics, which then go back through the various agents to the human body, and they create human resistance to antibiotics and antimicrobials. So while we now concentrate on the COVID-19, we tend to forget the agricultural system is the uh, basic source um, of, um, um, of um, infectious diseases, about more than 25% of infectious diseases and more than 50% of zoonotic diseases since 1940 are associated with the agriculture system. So, um, it, so, so the second path, the one that you saw now, is it has to do with um, not only the COVID pandemic, but other kinds of um, uh, epidemics that have not turned into uh, global pandemics um, like uh, uh, the Nile virus, SARS, MERS, uh, the HIV AIDS, all of them are rooted in environmental and ecosystem disturbances. They um, originate from animals which are domesticated uh, but also, as I said before, for the management of other subsectors of the food system, including crops, the management of crops, uh, use of chemicals, overuse of chemicals, etc. Now, if you look at the literature, um, as I said, it's, it, the synthesis of the literature shows that um, since 1940, agricultural drivers were associated with 25% of all and more than 50% of all zoonotic infectious diseases that emerged in humans. So this, according to scientists, are going to intensify and the frequency will increase as agriculture expands in the next years. So, um, it's, uh, so the massive then conversion and contamination of the ecosystems that we that we do has been to a large extent behind um, the and the overuse of agricultural inputs has been behind the various diseases, including uh, COVID. Now, the other part of it, of course, is and I'm not going to insist because I, I'm sure that um, it's now standard. It's that the urbanization and um, concentration of people in cities, uh, the long supply chains, um, which they are extremely complex and the, uh, the break um, in, um, in, in every part of it could create, of course, the types of crisis that you see today, uh, which are concentrated in urban areas, right? Beyond 
production, agriculture, that's what in the developing countries, that's where the most of the, of the problem is. Um, and, um, and, and, and so this results into two things. Um, first of all, the outbreaks of new infectious diseases, the ones that I mentioned before, um, that goes from animals to um, uh, from wild animals to domesticated animals to humans. Uh, but then the slow and protracted crisis that comes from existing human diseases like malaria, cancer type 2, diabetes, etc. And both those paths, the one that go from the left and the one that go from the right, um, contribute to that. So you have the uh, graphic artist here is a little bit too graphic. Yeah. Disease, deaths, poverty, and economic crisis that comes with um, um, the diseases and the measures um, uh, to, um, to face them. Okay, uh, got that. So this is, that's the first part of, of what okay. I was asked to do. Over to the okay. moderator. Okay, we will continue uh, the discussion on this later. I think what you, what the, the picture you painted us is that the, the world agriculture started with a tremendous uh, success story. It managed to produce increased productivity in, in everything, but this came at a cost with the loss of biodiversity and also affecting the biome of, uh, of people that, that brings diseases. And, uh, and that's where we are, uh, we are at now, uh, from these two, two ends. And uh, I think the, um, as you started to talk about um, uh, people moving in big cities, urbanization, um, it, it, it creates the need of a supply chain, which also has problems. And I, I'd like to, 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 to move uh, now to, to Tassos in Brussels. At, at Costas, just to, yes, I would make a point, right? Usually, it is the intensive systems that are blamed about everything, right? Um, however, one has to be very careful. First of all, both intensive and extensive systems are responsible for the prevalence of disease among humans, but also the intensive and backyard farming, in some cases, uh, people living with animals, it can be a source of uh, epidemics. So. Uh, we have to be balanced here in what we are talking about. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, so this is, I mean, what you described is a system that, uh, that really created, uh, creates uh, epidemics, basically. That's what you want to say. And, and you don't want to differentiate between, you think, I mean, your point is that both extensive and intensive systems uh, can, uh, are, are, can be responsible for this. Um, now, Costa, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen? And sure. uh, we, we move to, to Tasso. Tasso, I, I think um, you're starting, as I understand, you're starting tomorrow to chair uh, an organization that you helped to start a few years ago, an organization, a group that is looking at the uh, data and uh, in information about food systems. You will, talk, you will tell us about this. But from your perspective there, what was the, uh, and everybody, I think what we understand from the literature and what we read is that we, we don't have a food crisis like the one we had a decade ago. What we have, and most people are talking about, we're talking about disruptions and problems in the food supply chain. Now, how big this uh, problem is and, and, and how important it is, and then we will talk about how countries react, but please uh, unmute your, your microphone, Tasso, then. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Costa, and thanks. Uh, it's nice to be together in this panel with uh, colleagues. Of course, if you have uh, two, three uh, Greeks, let alone three, uh, we should not agree on everything. Uh, uh, I was teasing, but I, I would like to make a point based on what Costa said before, which is what you described, Costa, is correct not only for the food system, it's correct for the whole path of economic development. In fact, in all basic human needs, whether it's food, whether it's shelter, whether it's transport, whether it's energy, whether it's clothing, what development has done is it generated economic and social successes at the cost of the environment. And we have reached a level now what, where we need to do a big uh, rethinking of that. Now, coming back to the other cost of the, the chair of this panel uh, question. Yes, what we had 
10 years ago, it's pretty important to distinguish from what we're having now. Because 10 years ago, we had the crisis, a world economic crisis, the impact of the financial crisis that generated all sort of re reactions and debate about a food crisis. And at the time we had very high food prices and very low levels of stock. So the first thing that is different today is that when it comes to the level of the supply of the basic commodities, we are pretty comfortable. In fact, the level of stock is extremely high and although there are some problems here and there, locusts, for example, in Africa and India, dry weather, certain parts of Europe or what have you, it's not, the world is not going to run out of foods this year or next year. The second thing we have, which is uh, also interesting, is that we have a dramatic demand shock. We have had a part of the economy that stopped completely because of the impact of the uh, crisis of COVID. And this part of the economy includes a part that consumes a lot of food outside of home, whether it is in the form of restaurants, whether it's a form of hotels, whether it's a form of tourism, of uh, transport to traveling. And this had had a dramatic effect in the short term that generated all sort of logistical problems, seasonal workers, uh, transport, so, uh, the availability of, uh, of containers, uh, the need to bypass certain constraints in the movement of people without blocking the movement of goods. And here is where I believe the picture of food systems does not fit into this uh, food system is broken type of debate. And I think we should move into a situation where we avoid self-flagellation and self-congratulation. Food systems have had innovative elements that are pretty important to keep in mind for what is coming tomorrow. And this includes, if you want right now, the very rapid expansion of digitalization in all spheres of uh, our activities. Now, a third element, and here I would agree that we do have some uh, pretty significant concerns is what was raised by, by Costa. Now, the impact of the economic crisis is not known yet. Uh, we know that the drop of the economic activities, the most dramatic we have seen uh, probably in a century. We don't know whether it's going to be a V-type recovery, a U-type, a W-type or whatever shape it takes. What we know is that there's going to be a significant part of people that will have two types of problems. First, having enough money to consume, including on basic needs, and that includes food. And second, enough confidence soon enough to get out of their home and go back to restaurants, travel, hack people and do the normal activities of uh, human beings that allow them to do certain things around food, which is also linked to cultural characteristics that we did before. And this is a big, big unknown. And that's the part that we need to, to discuss and see what we do about that. And in discussing what we do about that, I think we need to draw one of the lessons, of, I would say two of the lessons of how we respond to the crisis right now that are very pertinent to agriculture. The first one is that there are ways of increasing economic and environmental efficiency at the same time. And this is size neutral. It goes beyond the big and the small, uh, the, the organic or the conventional. It has to do with targeting in a more uh, advanced way, in a more knowledge-based way, the type of practices we apply on the ground. And that's a very important element to keep in mind. The second type of uh, response, and that's a very personal uh, opinion based also on the experience I had when I was based in uh, the delegation of uh, the commission in, in Washington in the beginning of the GMO debate, has to do about the role of science. If you look at what is happening right now in the search of uh, 
responses to COVID, whether it's on biotechnology, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's nanotechnology, in human health, we're using, we're using the frontier of these technologies. This is not exactly what we're doing in other areas, especially in plant health. And there is a big debate that we need to have about the role of science that is getting more complex because the, the trust in public institutions has gone down. And this is why in the current uh, situation, we have a debate where all sort of conspiracy theories can go all over the place. And I think here, there are also some important lessons that we need uh, to see what we get out of them as we move forward. That's what I had on the first round. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tasso. So, so um, Tasso, you, you gave us a very optimistic view. You said that the, 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 there are enough stocks. The world uh, is not going to run out of food. I must say here, and then we can discuss it later, but I, I think the world was never out of food. The problem was always the distribution. It was not reaching the, the, the people. So I think, uh, especially with, with, with the pandemic, something that you, you talked about, and uh, again, you were very optimistic, so I'm picking up on you. I must say that Tassos and I were going a long, long uh, time ago, and he's the only one in the panel, I think, who has been in the real Omphalos uh, several times. This is the virtual Omphalos continent, but anyway, we'll talk about that later, uh, another time. But, but So, so you, you, you were also optimistic that the, the, the food supply chain is going to, 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 to solve uh, the problem and, the, and it will be, everything is, is going to, to find its way. Technology is a big thing. So you, you say you're, you're, um, you're really hoping that um, technology, biotechnology, digital technology is going to really uh, make its miracle again. And I think this, this um, we, we have somebody here in the panel who uh, I think a few people know and have studied the technology in agriculture as much as David Zilberman. And uh, David, um, would you like to give us uh, your take on this? And uh, would, would you like me to try to try and uh, share your slides? Okay. You Try to send the show this slide. If not, I can go. Okay. Can I'll, you hear me? I'll try. You can, you can start speaking and I will try to uh, okay. see what I can So do. what I'd like to do is to give you some overview and perspective from the U.S. I'm really very, uh, very uh, happy to speak with uh, my friend in Greece. And uh, I feel that we are in a global situation. We are all, uh, all together. Next slide. A next slide. Can you move to the next slide? Uh, oh, you don't see the slide? Ah, okay. Um, I thought, uh, okay, let me. Okay, a next slide. Okay, if not, I can speak. Okay. So, so, so generally, the first thing, and I agree with Costas, we basically we speak about the zootonic disease, and the zootonic disease. Uh, are diseases that really started in agriculture. And to me, this, one of the stories is very simple. There was a big short, shortage of pork in China because of the African swine flu. And that probably was a, the main reason why uh, we, 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 uh, people start expanding the use of, uh, of uh, bush meat. And the net effect is that suddenly we have a disease. This is not the first time it happened. We have the avian flu, we have other things. So to some extent, uh, once in a while, we have this set of diseases. And my feeling is that it's not the end of the world. We have to monitor it. And to me, uh, one big problem that we have to recognize is the regular disease, the swine flu that we weren't able to control. And it resulted in a shortage of uh, pork in China that led to this disease. The second point is the heterogeneity. If you, generally, if you look at the impact, which I look at deaths per million. So in Spain, we speak about 600 deaths per million. In the US, 300. Uh, in Belgium, 900. But in India, in Senegal, in Ghana, the number is small. Even if you look at, uh, even if, even if you look at uh, within the US, 
different state of different uh, impact. So you can really see that the heterogeneity metal and therefore to some extent, while you have to limit travel, you have to have different type of policy because in many parts of the world, the main problem is not the disease, but the way that you treat the disease. Now, what are the main factors that cause the disease? Next slide. What are the main factors that cause the disease? They, uh, okay, the next one it is travel around the world. Okay, keep, keep it, I'll go there. Travel around the world, policy response, people did country, different uh, countries, people did uh, respond at the same time. Another thing is AIDS, it's a disease that affects old people and uh, to a large extent kills old people and then climate differences. So what you can see that this disease is big in the north because of climate and much less in the south because of climate and travel. Okay, so next. So if you look at it, you will have to do benefit cost analysis and you recognize that the benefit of uh, strict policies of uh, shelter in place is that you save life, but the cost, uh, but the uh, cost are loss of livelihood, poverty, and food security. Now next, okay, now if you look at food, there are several sectors. Uh, if you look at workers, the main workers that affect it are not farm workers, are food workers in the urban sectors. Farmers are mostly affected because they get low prices and because the supply chain is broken, but altogether they are able to sell their, their food at less lower prices. When the supply chain is, is broken, they are su uh, suffering. Now, the area, the area that most of the crisis occur, almost all over the world, is in uh, processing and retailing because of uh, shelter in place. So food services is devastated, retailers are devastated, restaurants are devastated. On the other end, there is a big, big chain, chain in the food sector, and I'll speak a little bit about it uh, uh, the next time. That, next time, okay, if you look, that, 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 uh, that, that what we will see in the long run is some change. First, we will see shorter supply chain because people would realize, gosh, we cannot really depend on the big supply chain. It's not that globalization will end, it will become much more compact. Secondly, we will see automation of harvesting because if you look at many European countries, California, Florida, and as long as some African countries, when you don't have access to immigrants, suddenly you are stuck. People will take food safety seriously. Think about it. To me, the big crisis is that medicine didn't look at chronic disease and not at the infections. And infections are still uh, are, are still important and they may grow. The next thing we will see an increase in virtual food delivery. We will move to a virtual world. That will be the big thing that we see. Now, one thing that I worry about is consolidation because a traditional firm got a shock. Big companies like, uh, for example, Walmart and some of the big supermarkets are doing better because people basically uh, buy food from shop and uh, use the delivery services. So they gain what some restaurants lost. Another thing that I really see that would be big is all this idea of vegetable uh, free, uh, free meat. I think uh, we will see it uh, both because of climate change and because people are more uh, worried about uh, meat. And I, there is increased appreciation of science. Even Trump has to admit that science has something to say. And I wouldn't be surprised if regulations that especially allow CRISPR uh, and GMO would, will be introduced because to some extent they could have solved the problem of the, of the, uh, of the swine flu in China. Next one, I'm almost, I'm almost done. Okay, now what are the lessons? We really realize that human and wanted are very vulnerable, climate change, diseases, etc. But we also can realize that we have uh, resilience. The food system, despite of all the problem, function very well in, uh, despite of everything. The other thing is policy matter. If you interfere in the right time, you can really solve a lot of problem and control of the disease. Now, if you have heavy hand, like I think what happened let's say in India, you may solve uh, one problem, but you may create a big problem. So you need to have policies that really is paying attention to where, uh, where you are. The other thing is international dependence. You may limit travel, but you need to share information. We need to work uh, all together 
And the last point is that we have this fight between science of popul and populism. It will continue, but I really think that we need to pay more, uh, 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 more attention to science. Now, my, the last question is that, uh, that, that, that we really have an issue that, uh, that, what are, what are, that we have several uh, questions. How long it will last? A lot depends on the vaccine and depends on science. How strong the facts will be the recovery? And I think the key point of this disease will be political. In the US, will we continue to have Trump or will we have a change? If we'll have a change, it will change the system very much. And the global system, will it make the EU stronger or will it make it weaker? And then the relation between US, China and the EU. So my feeling is this. It, it's a disease that uh, started from uh, agricultural reasons. It caused some shock to the agricultural system, not so much the disease itself, but the treatment of the disease. But it will have a significant uh, impact or, or, uh, on, uh, on our world, on the political system, the economic system. And I hope that science uh, will gain out of it because this disease could have been prevented to, or be reduced if we add more investment, both in, uh, in infectious diseases, in, uh, in in agricultural technology. And I hope that people realize that a lot of the fears that we have are exaggerated. And if you could rely on science, we will be better off. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so I, I think uh, you, you gave us a pass for the next question which I want to, uh, to start the next round of questions, which I want to start with, uh, with uh, Leanne here, because you said the big question is policy, it's what countries are going to do. Because the system, uh, I think you all, uh, you all told us that the system, although Kostas uh, Samoulis, he told us that there, is, there are problems that he has created a, a lot of problems uh, which are extremely complex, but the system has functioned quite well so far and he has reacted to the crisis quite well. And the technology is there and will, uh, will, will, will do things and will still progress and solve a lot of problems. But how countries are going to react? I think we have on one side the demand, which uh, Tasso started to talk, and we'll get back to this. But um, how have countries reacted to this, uh, Leanne? Uh, you have the, the World Trade Organization perspective there. So tell us a little bit about this. What happened there? Unmute, unmute, unmute your uh, microphone. Still, you still, you okay. Now okay. Can... Yeah, <laughs> there's too many moving parts. Okay, so um, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here with part of with this group of very knowledgeable people who I have some history with. Um, so what I wanted to do, and and actually the previous three speakers have kind of set this up in a good way. Um, because we, we, we are talking a lot about the shocks to the system, where the shocks came from. And then we were just starting to get to the question of how governments have responded. Now, of course, the issue is, from my perspective, I'm, I'm the head of the Agri-Food Trade and Markets Division at the OECD. Um, and so we've been asking the question, what's really going on with agri-food markets and have what initially seemed like very dramatic disruptions how have those evolved over time? So we saw some big shocks and we've already heard examples of these and every, everyone probably who's listening had experiences going to grocery stores and seeing empty shelves. But over time, um, you started to see that the food chain was still working. So the question is what kinds of policies uh, did governments implement or measures did they implement to try to help smooth things along? Um, and how did they balance the trade-off between needing to take very dramatic measures to handle the health crisis while ensuring that they could make sure that food products, food and agricultural products were moving to where they needed to be. So just as a reminder, um, we, we start, or I start with the assumption that trade is important for food security, right? Because what you're trying to do with trade is you're connecting areas of surplus production to areas where, where there's a demand. And what you, what, 
in the world that we're living in now, we're seeing more and more shocks to production. And now we have this pandemic, which has a, a sort of uh, chaos of shocks around the food system. And what trade and markets allow is for products to, to move, right? We want them to be able to move from where they're produced. And when we have these shocks, um, especially if they're production shocks, uh, we want to be able to source food um, flexibly, and we want producers to be able to find those market opportunities. Um, and what we've seen globally, of course, is that the regions where we think, where we see that populations are growing are not necessarily the regions where you can sustainably increase agricultural production. So we need to keep being able to move products around. So what have we seen in terms of um, policies that um, countries have implemented since the pandemic? Um, so the graph on the right hand side of my slide is just a count of measures. So as in the trade and agriculture directorate at the OECD, we have a tracker that we implemented just mostly for our own education, where we were keeping track of trade measures and also um, agricultural trade measures and some agricultural domestic policies. So these are just um, simple counts of things we observed. And what we observe is that a lot of the policies that governments were taking were intended to facilitate or enhance the movement of food and agricultural products from where that's being produced to where it was needed. So um, for example, if you look at border, border procedures, there was a lot of effort to make sure that border procedures were, um, were facilitated, were uh, reduced sort of some of the red tape moved towards digital procedures. Um, on the flip side, we saw, if you look at the numbers, you can see that there were, there's quite a few countries that implemented export restrictions, which normally we'd be quite worried about. But in fact, what our information shows is that most of the export restrictions that countries took early on um, to limit the exports of food and agriculture from their countries um, were instituted with fixed, fixed timeframes. So it was clear that they were being initiated and it was clear when those would stop. Um, so this is different from the situation a decade ago where we saw a lot of export restrictions that led to the food price crisis where they were implemented over a long period of time. Another example that's interesting is the question of public stocks. And again, this story is slightly different now from what we saw um, more than a decade ago, um, there's, there's a diversity of the way countries are using um, their measures related to public stock holding. And if you look at the, the measures that we've tracked at the OECD, and this is concentrating on mostly OECD countries um, and some of the AMIS countries, the countries that are involved in the agricultural market information system, we see that more countries are actually um, dis distributing from their stocks than procuring stocks. So this isn't a global number, but what we've observed, for example, is that India, who um, in the previous food price crisis was, um, did a lot of procurement, <laughs> actually has been massively using distribution from their stocks to help address their food security concerns. Um, so. So the point of this slide really is to just say that um, in order to, to keep food and agricultural moving, we need to make sure that we're investing in policies that are not restricting movement to products, but are finding ways to facilitate the movement of products. And maybe just one shout out to this question of coordination strategies. So we've also seen in the past couple of months, several, um, several instances where countries have come together to agree to not implement trade restricting measures. So there was a G20 Ag Minister statement to that effect. At the WTO, there was a group of 23 countries that um, committed to keeping supply chains open and removing trade restrictive measures. So that's quite encouraging as well to see that um, countries are moving in that direction, recognizing that there is a need to stay connected. Like now is not the moment to try to be disconnected. So the next slide I have is looking specifically at um, the incidence of 
uh, notifications related to technical barriers and um, SPS measures at the border. So this is based on data from the WTO. Um, and what, and it, it's looking at the product coverage um, of what has been notified. So we have four categories shown here. There's um, measures related to food, general measures, which are things like when a country notifies that they are taking, um, taking a measure that covers all kinds of veterinary drugs. So you don't know which product um, specifically it's focused on um, because it's related to notifying the information about the drug. Um, notifications related to live animals and notifications related to plant products. At the WTO, members can, um, they can implement measures on an emergency basis, but they're not meant to stay there forever. So of, these, of this information, um, about half of them were temporary measures put in place. And what we've seen is members are notifying that they're using a lot of um, streamlining of certification at the border, electronic um, uh, form keeping to make sure that things can get approved more quickly and with fewer um, people involved so that you can keep the distancing uh, through the process. There have been some relaxation of technical requirements for, for food products, but not related to safety issues, more related to labeling. So we've had certain countries who have, for example, typically had labeling requirements across multiple languages, and they would loosen what requirements they had for the languages on their labels. And then on the one category that we have seen through the WTO notifications, more information about um, SPS measures that were restricting trade was um, related to the trade in live animal products. And given what we've heard already in this discussion, that is for obvious reasons, right? Because there's a clear potential risk of spreading disease through trade in animal products. So when you look at the broad picture, um, it's looking like countries are being pragmatic at trying to handle how moving products across the border can be facilitated, even in the context of having quite dramatic disruptions in terms of the people who are working on the border. Now, the last slide I wanted to mention is sort of a forward looking because I know we're supposed to be forward looking. And one of the concerns that comes up is what the cascade effect can be in terms of um, disruptions for inputs into the next agricultural production season. So the example I have up here relates to seed markets. Um, and the, the graph is just showing how there's this asynchronous timing of um, planting and harvesting of wheat, just as an example, um, for the calendar year. So you can see that there's sort of a cascade of um, when the seeds are planted and when they're harvested. And the, the question is not so much this harvest season, but for the next harvest season, are we handling the way the seed markets are working um, to minimize disruption for future harvests. And the question really relates to, again, these labor disruptions where if you have health, um, you have measures put in place to limit contact of people, what does that mean for certifying seed, for checking the seed that while it's being grown, what's, how are you handling the labeling and the moving of the seed back and forth? Because seed can cross borders five or six times between where it's produced and where it's actually planted. Um, and what we've observed here is also that countries are, are trying to implement flexible solutions while still respecting some of the certification requirements for um, standards around the seeds that are being produced. And that um, having a lot of effort for communicating what's going on in the field is really important. So the people who are actually working on the, on the production of seed are communicating what's happening in terms of the volume of production, what they need to keep it moving so that um, in the future, uh, the harvest won't be impacted. So just maybe as a, as a wrap up, um, one of the things that was struck me listening to the three pre previous speakers is that there really is a series of trade-offs that um, policymakers are making when they're thinking about food and agriculture. And they're balancing 
making sure that there's enough food being produced, what's happening with the livelihoods of farmers and people along the food chain, and also these environmental questions. How can, how can agriculture actually be a positive force in terms of the environment? Um, and at the OECD, what we've been arguing is that this could be an opportunity to repurpose some of the way that um, governments have been supporting agriculture to move support off of distorting production, which may lead to, for example, less environmentally friendly approaches or a stickier decision-making process for farmers and move it into policies um, and investments that can support resilience and sustainability in the food system. So I'll stop there. Looking forward to- Thank you very discussion. much. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Leanne. Um, okay, great. So um, I, I think you, you ended up uh, raising the question about uh, the environment and how agriculture can actually support the environment instead of the opposite that we have observed. And I, and I think I, I will turn now to, to Tassos because uh, I, I, I'm really eager to hear, uh, not only me, but I think uh, people in 27 countries in, 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 in Europe uh, to tell us about the, the new strategy that was uh, unfolded uh, just a couple of days ago, the Farm to Fork strategy, Tassos. And, uh, and tell us a little bit of the background of this. I mean, it was delayed. We were, we were expecting this uh, a few months ago. It was delayed and delayed again. And uh, how has the pandemic affected this? And uh, b before you get into what is, uh, what is uh, really the Farm to Fork uh, strategy do, what, what should farmers expect? And what uh, should the consumers expect out of this and the citizens in the, in the world? Thank you. Unmute, unmute, Tasso. Unmute. Sorry, yeah. Start over. Start over. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, why it was delayed uh, for a very simple reason that uh, you saw me today in uh, the office and I'm basically alone because there is very few people. I mean, so it's obvious that when you have an impact like the one you had in COVID, you just don't go around and introduce big changes like this without looking what your priorities are. And we're talking about a two month delay. Now, in, uh, in this, exactly because there are, uh, as always, when the commission puts out a proposal, different opinions about that, let's look a little bit about the background. Two years ago, we started a discussion about the future of the common agricultural policy, which basis was essentially what I said earlier on, that when it comes to economic and social uh, issues, we have made major progress. And uh, EU farm income is pretty stable, uh, the trade uh, uh, surplus is growing every uh, year. And uh, the World Bank did a study that indicated that there has been a reduction in, in poverty in rural areas in the EU. But this has happened at the specific cost of the environment. Now, let's put this in a global context. And for those that want a little bit more details, I have done a couple of recent articles in LinkedIn. You can find me and find more details and background about that. In all the major e agricultural systems around the world, the EU is the only one that managed to produce more with less. The US has produced more with roughly the same. And the other systems, big ones, Brazil, India, and China have produced more with more emissions. That being said, we have already identified with our impact assessment three years ago that we have had stagnation in environmental progress and in progress in emissions in the EU. Previous reforms gave a momentum that has been exhausted. So we already put as a big priority the focus on climate action and the need to reduce much more emissions. The second thing that is important is we do have a food system in the European Union that I think uh, in certain ways give global standards, even if some people, some of the standards are something that what people disagree about. And the third thing that was uh, also extremely important, and that comes to the questions that I also had to answer uh, briefly on, on technology, we have another system the Copernicus system of our satellite imagery that provides information 
that is top in terms of quality. I'm pretty sure there are other satellites, American or Chinese, that provide the same accuracy, but ours is public, in the public domain, and everybody can download it and use this for free. Now, these, if you want, are three potential champions of the past that need to break new records if we want to be serious. Because the targets that we have set and the ambition in terms of emission reductions in the European Union are extremely high because we take seriously the respect of the Paris Agreement on Climate Action. And because we think this is a global challenge for which we have the obligation to show to the rest of the world that what we're proposing is possible. And here is where the Farm to Fork came with extremely ambitious targets. 50% reduction of uh, pesticides use, 50% reduction in the use of antibiotics in animals. These are not new, if you want, and we were expecting them, but it also came with targets of 25% of area going to organic, 10% of area going to landscape features, roughly we have four and a half percent now. And on top of that, a reduction of nutrient losses of 50% by 2030 of this, uh, which corresponds to some reduction of fertilizers roughly to 20%. These are, if you want in our jargon and we'll always come with new terms, uh, what is called aspirational targets. I like to talk about inspiration targets more but these are targets that we have to introduce at the EU level in the strategic plans of member states. And let me uh, focus here on where I think this is also linked to some of the questions that have been asked, including one of uh, Alecos. I mean, it's normal that as humans, we want to have the cake and eat it. It's also natural that there are going to be some trade-offs about this. And what we tend to forget is that at global level, the first thing that we have to ask and give an answer to that is do we need to produce more food with less impacts or can we live with less food and less impacts? I have absolutely no doubt that the European Union can live with less, with less. But I'm also certain that the world needs more with less. And this is where the real question marks that we have the real question is the following. We have right now technologies that allows us to increase economic efficiency and reduce costs. In the last three years, year after year in the, our agricultural lateral conference, we have brought three different types of examples of agriculture. We started with agroecology, we moved to conventional, and last uh, December we had organic agriculture. The use of digital technologies allowed all these three different types of agriculture to improve their economic efficiency, reduce costs, improve yields, and reduce significantly the environmental impact. So that's the optimistic side. But let me correct you, Costa, I wasn't optimistic overall, because this type of technologies are coming with very significant knowledge gaps application gaps and gaps in terms of perception of acceptance of these uh, technologies. And one of the most important areas there is this data issue, because we need to have ways of breaking the respect of the economic data of farmers, which will always be private and has to be protected with a type of information that is in a public uh, domain goods, whether it's on soil, on water, on air, on biodiversity. And here, I'm not going to go now in the details, we have provided concrete ideas of how this is going to be done in the future. If you want, we are experimenting in the European Union on whether it is possible to turn this huge climate change challenge into a growth strategy. And I finish with one example on agriculture that in my view, we have underestimated. If you're in, a, the coal industry, the energy, the transport, or anywhere, there are going to be jobs that with new technologies are going to be lost. And there are going to be jobs that we hope are going to be created and have a net growth effect. When it comes to agriculture, the number of farmers is decreasing because of demographics. We're not asking farmers 
to become something different. We're asking farmers to become better farmers, more knowledge-based farmers. And here is a responsibility of public authorities to develop these farm advisory systems that would tell people how they can do this transition to a, an agriculture that could be able to, in practice and not just in theory, that we can jointly increase the economic and environmental efficiency of farming. Okay, I, I th thank you, Tasu. You just answered uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, David was asking uh, from Greece about the, the importance of uh, and, and the political aspect of the whole uh, extension system. I think it's going to, I think they, we can conclude, I think, very easily that it is, it's extremely important. It's more important than ever. But I, I, I think we have uh, many questions here, and I would like to I, I, I like to raise some of the questions that people have put in. One is that um, you know there is there is this global this general view that, uh, and I think Costas has started this by telling us some, how the the food systems have created diseases and have created all these problems. And uh, and some people are asking here. Uh, we have several questions. Is this the the the, the, the the solution is to go back to natural. Is this um, so? We're going back to produce, uh, um, you know, non-industrialized. I think um, small farms. I mean, that's one aspect of this. Uh, smaller farms, shorter supply chains, um, and I, I think in this comes also several questions about the use of biotechnology, um, genetically modified CRISPR technology. How will all this uh, come together in the future? And uh, how has, uh, David, I'm just looking at you. I, I, I think uh, every time I talk about biotechnology, I think of you. So would you like to take a, a, a little bit this, this big question? Will we, will we go back to natural production? Is this the, is this the solution? Oh, in, in my view, I really feel that uh, the notion of the bioeconomy is really important. And uh, to some extent, when you look at this disease, everyone spoke about something like the Spanish flu. The number of deaths would be reach a million globally. The food system operates, the population is growing. To some extent, what you really have is good science and bad policy. My feeling, obviously, I can understand the desire to go back to family, to family farm. But if you want to reduce human footprint and deal with climate change and have agriculture a key for it, is we have to take advantage of science. In the same way that we wouldn't have a vaccine without modern science, we wouldn't be able to solve our problem with modern science. We wouldn't have this disease if we would have used potential to deal with this, with this one flu. So to me, we have to deal with the political and distributional issues, but we cannot, we cannot ignore CRISPR. CRISPR and GMO can go with organic, then you can replace a pesticide. But if you say, let's go to nature and go to the 19, to 1800, in 1800, we have 1 billion people and they didn't eat that well. Now we have several uh, billion people. My feeling is this, that with modern science, we can really reduce the footprint of agriculture. We can actually move to, to animal-free food. We actually use agriculture as a major mechanism to solve climate change and sequester carbon. And actually agriculture will be stronger. Moving to systems that basically is sentimental would actually make climate change worse. So to some extent, we need to make sure that the system be work better, that regulation are there, that we have movement of trade, that we that our people is to educate policymakers and the public about the value of science in all its limitations, rather than to be a sentimental. At least in the US, I think that this is a, this has been quite a revolution because we have a populist president that suddenly people realize that the king is naked. But I think it's really a, important in other countries to realize that we cannot really go backwards when we have a bigger problem with this climate change. I think that the COVID altogether was contained, is contained. The economic impact of the COVID are big, but climate change wouldn't be contained this way. We need to have much more 
efficient agriculture, and we are, in order to have efficiency, we have to rely on science of technology. Uh, thank you, David. So, uh, Costa, um, how? Okay, so in 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 the north, we can produce less and uh, consume less, and we will still be fine, and we will we will we will uh, impact the 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 environment less, and uh, we will increase biodiversity thanks to the subsidies and the the policies and the restrictions that are coming from Brussels, at least in the 27 countries. But um, how is this, the developing world coping with this? And, and uh, what, what they should expect in both in the production side and the structure of the farms? And, uh, what, what, what is happening there? I think in your project, you had a, a very good view of, the, of how the different um, developing countries have reacted to this, how, wh what sort of policies they have. Can you give us uh, uh, this this knowledge now? Can you give us this information? I think um, Aleko asked a provocative question. Do we want to go back to producing less, prices will be high, and people will be more hungry, etc.? I think uh, I think that's a rather simplistic view of the world, and uh, the world cannot go back, right? The idea here is my basic thesis is also starts from where Leanne's um, remark ended, meaning that the traditional sustainability agenda of the food system, if we solve that, we will also solve to a very large extent the genesis of a zoonotic and other types of diseases that come out of, the, of agriculture in the food system right um, along with the traditional agenda of sustainability mm -hmm. now i think david uh, gave um a, a, i'll get to your question about because some of the things that you hear is um i think uh, david i fully agree with david this is an issue of scientific um and there are solutions on the table that will take care of um, th that would take care of a lot of these issues, like uh, emissions uh, that will that will produce um, adequate food with less environmental problems. In my view, in the developing countries, you see the problem is an issue of transition. That is, if we were to get the farmers to adopt technologies that are more environment friendly, let's put it. I'm just putting quotes because it's more than sustainability is more than just environment, right? But let's suppose that the initial investment vis-a-vis -vis when this investment will start bringing back the gains from it, because there is there are investments that are climate smart and they're profitable at the end of the day. But who's going to cover this period? Where is the credit markets? Where is the risk sharing markets, etc.? I think Aleko has worked a lot on this stuff, but this is short-term issues. Those are long-term problems, right? So adopting technologies, especially if they're riskier, et cetera, you need somewhere to lean on. You have a livelihood that depends on agriculture. If you adopt a technology which is promising, et cetera, but it fails, you're, you're dead. I mean, it's as simple as that, right? So. So I'm not going back with the Luddites, let's say, let's go back to a hundred years ago, et cetera, et cetera. However, I believe in what we call, the, what I call the twin track approach, who approach the system from two sides. One is educating consumers because some of these issues of overconsumption, the food loss and waste, which is quite, maybe not one third like FAO says, but it's quite important. Um, more uh, rational consumption of livestock products in the countries that they consume too much, like the European Union, um, permit me to say, um, and the United States even more, etc. More so, more rational consumption patterns, and at the end, at the because we always think of farm technologies, and then on on the farm and post farm technologies like shorter supply chains, etc there are these technologies that can improve the system. So we have to approach the system from both sides. Let's go back to the developing countries though. 
you know, I, hearing that there is not enough food in the world uh, makes me a little bit cringe. We monitor 74 countries and under the first program, we monitor bi-weekly 33 of them, all developing countries, some of them in crisis regions, right? And so it's the food is somewhere, but some of it is rotting in farmers' um, yards and they cannot sell it, especially the uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and other nutritional stuff. While prices and panic buying in the markets um, in urban areas are going up. So panic buying and, and some shortages are causing prices to go up. As I said, we monitor quite a few of them. And we, we also uh, had a questionnaire that was responded by about 868 city and local governments in terms of how they handle the problem of the uh, coronavirus and et cetera. Some of those things are not really related to free borders, et cetera. It's simply a question of dysfunctioning food systems. So there are long chains and they break down. So, um, so the, we, it's, not, it's not as simple as it may be in some other places uh, of the world, and, and et cetera. Thank you, Costa. Let me give you, uh, I will give you a very simple example to, to see that the digitalization dream is it's very nice, but, but it's not uh, very applicable to some of the places we are working with, right? You have closing of schools, right? A lot of kids, they get 75% of their nutrient intakes in school meals. Schools close down and a lot of governments, especially in urban areas, they don't have alternative distribution um, systems like New York, which they distribute about a million meals a day or something to people that are affected by closing schools, et cetera, et cetera. So governments have done pretty much the same things that Western governments had lockdowns and restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you deal with 1.2 billion um, slum dwellers in developing countries that they are not registered, they don't have access to official social protection systems that have now exploded in the developing countries. It's a huge wave of social protection, et cetera. So there, there is quite a few differences that one has to deal with. Last part, Costa, I think we are dealing mm -hmm. with how to fix the system in the long term. We may overcome COVID. And my presentation was half of what I was going to say because I said, what are the problems that are created? We have to intervene in technology, in policies, and in the governance of the system, right? And one significant part of the governance is like the D in the developing countries, the uh, detachment between agriculture and health. So you, you have a different, uh, agriculture and health are not talking to each other. So something like that explodes and they just, you know, act independently, which is, et cetera. So there, there are three or four major entry points, which is not just, you know, having enough food. Thank you. Thank you, Gosa. I, I think, you, you said something that uh, I'm, I'm sure it uh, it, uh, it, uh, it sounded uh, very nicely to uh, Tassos' ears, because when, you know, you, you said about this uh, separation between health and, and food and agriculture, and uh, we saw the announcement of the farm to fork policy with uh, the, from the environment commissioner and the food and the health commissioner but not from the Agricultural Commissioner. I, I, I'll, I'll keep that because I'm, I'm at the end, because I, I know Tassos is going to take about a couple of hours to, 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 to answer and defend this. But I, I, I want to remind you that my digital clock here that I have, somebody brought from Tiananmen Square in the 90s, it tells me that we have very few, very uh, only 10 minutes. And uh, with, with this, I would like to go and, and ask you to make a final statement but uh, I, I want to raise, because we've got several extremely interesting questions. People are watching and, and are sending questions. And I, I'll just uh, give you some headlines. Food waste, okay? Um, there is a, 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 I mean, food waste was brought several times, but uh, now we see it, especially in, in, uh, in relation to uh, lack of labor, um, 
seasonal labor, fruits and vegetables, and we see this in Greece, we see it in many, in, in many places in, in the north, in the UK, in Germany, and I'm sure, I don't know the picture in the developing countries. The other, the other problem that you also raised, uh, uh, Kosa, I think, is, is, um, is about everybody is blaming uh, the meat industry. Everybody is blaming the meat industry. And and people are talking about uh, you know we should consume less meat. You 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 said that. And uh, and I know that Passos has uh, written a couple of things on this. And I I also look at the numbers. The beef. I didn't uh, say that. Okay. Okay. No, I didn't say that. You blame it. I said you mentioned the meat, the meat industry. If I said that, that that was a slip of my tongue. Um, I I just uh, I just heard it from you. So, uh, so we get several questions about that. Should we change our diet? Should we go? I mean, what about the technology? What about this uh, plant-based meat and, and so on? Is this wh what are we going to see in the future? So these are several questions. The other question is about energy, the link of energy and agriculture. I think we've seen that so much in the last uh, decades. We see it also as a part of the of the food crisis in uh, 2008, 2009. Um, a lot of food, a lot of, you know, corn and, and so on is, is used to produce energy. What is going to happen in the future? Is it, is it going to continue, especially in, 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 in the U.S.? Um, I, I think we have uh, many, many uh, questions that I, I, I really will do. Uh, I'm sure I will do an injustice uh, because uh, I didn't, I couldn't catch all of them. But I would like to go around, and, uh, and you can pick uh, whatever you want very, very briefly. Leon, I will start with you, and then I will go to David, and, uh, and then I will end up with, uh, with us. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I, I wanted to circle back on this question of um, trust in, in policymakers and trust in science, because I think that that's probably a big part of the issue. And... Um, and my concerns are if we, if we start to be mistrustful that having economies that are working together to try to make the agricultural food system globally working, um, if we lose trust in that, then it's gonna be a bad situation for the world, right? We need, we need to somehow find a way to, to generate that trust. And part of it, I think, and this links to, I can't remember who made the comment, but um, I think it was Costas, getting government decision makers to be able to talk, talk across the silos, right? You need the people who are responsible for agriculture, the people who are responsible for health, and you know, there's other parts of the system, but at least those two need to be talking to each other and figuring out a way that decisions are taken in a coherent way <laughs> to move the whole system in the right direction. So I'll stop there um, and we can come back. Thank you, David. I think we will take we will take a few more minutes because we had some technical issues. So we can have if, he, if, if okay. it's okay with you, we'll take a few more minutes. My, my feeling is this: this is the, the the economic recovery is a big challenge, and it, it's a big challenge within a within a glo within a global system, and uh, to some and uh, overcoming uh, some of the suspicions. At, uh, on science and uh, technology and other uh, collaborative institutions, as well as political opportunism will be the biggest challenge that we have. As scientists, I think our biggest challenge is to convince the public anywhere we want that if we want to deal with climate change and we want to deal with other uh, issues, we really must to rely on science because the alternative is worse. I think the other issues is to recognize that we have big issues of inequality beyond, uh, beyond food that are a main uh, cause of concern and unhappiness and to develop systems that improve social safety nets. To me, there are two key words, social safety nets that have to be improved and science. And in order to do it, one key challenge is to have more distributional uh, policies. In the case of the US, higher taxes and more efficient government to distribute these resources. Okay. 
That's uh, interesting that this proposal comes from the United States. Thank you, David. Uh, Tasso. Unmute, unmute. Maybe you spill some espresso coffee with it or not. Hmm? Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know if I can unmute. Tasso is mute. You can unmute yourself, Tasso. You can unmute yourself, Tasso. Ah, uh, he's. Uh, yeah. um, he can unmute himself. I can, so he should. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, now we can hear you. So, sorry, I was trying to answer at the same time to a question, and you cannot do two things the same time, even if if you work for the European Commission. Now, very briefly, uh, three things. Uh, the, the last one is uh, on the question I was trying to answer. It's not 35, it's 25% of organic. And part of the crucial uh, element of that is the demand should be there. So if the consumers are there, how much will go for a human consumption? And how much for animal that will be uh, organically produced? We cannot determine ourselves. Two other things that have come up in a lot of questions, and here I, it's clearly my personal opinion. The first thing is, that's where I have tried to stick my neck out over a, a lot of the last years is, we need to get the numbers right. For me, it's irrelevant whether we are going to eat more or less red meat if we don't ask ourselves first, do we eat more red meat? And the answer is no. Overall, the level of consumption of beef is the same since 1960 and in the developed world has gone down. We still have increases in obesity and a series of diseases that are associated with this. Why? First of all, there is a distributional issue. Not everybody consumes in the same way. And second, there is an issue for other type of things that go into our food, including feed additives that play and food additives that play a very significant role with some of these diseases. So that's the debate that we need to have in a much more global way. And finally, in terms of the role of science and the public institution. Now, it is important for scientists to be able to communicate. And if, as a scientist, you choose the term genetic engineering to try to sell a technology without knowing what the history of Europe is, you're going to have problems. And in Europe, we lost a whole generation of that. And I think there are two areas where we have to give a battle in terms of the role of science in policy making. One is the vaccination of children. If after what happened in, in recent years, we lose again this battle, then it's not worth giving a battle for science anymore. And that's the tragedy. We also have the farce, but the farce is increasing. How many people believe that the earth is flat and there is a whole conspiracy theory there? Look at the statistics of younger people. So there are elements out there, basic common sense elements that we need to give the battle early on. And if we give the battle early on, then we can get more trust in public institutions, provided that we do not actually contradict ourselves every other uh, few years. And that's enough for the moment. Um, okay, Costa, very briefly. Yeah. Um, the, the, the meat issue. I, I'm not sure why Tassos uh, talks about red meat. The question is not red meat. It's livestock products in general, right? That's where, I mean, one has to look at the environmental issues associated with livestock consumption. Now, it's not that the whole world should go out of meat eating. Um, a majority of people in many developing countries, they just don't need um, high um, quality proteins because they don't consume um, livestock uh, products that are that contain high quality nutrients. And so those people should increase some of their intake, but not follow the Western standards, if that's possible, right? So that's the, that's the, the, the issue of livestock product question. Second point, I would like to really um, support the, the, the whole issue of uh, equality, right? The, the distribution of food and calories and income at the end of the day, which can make a huge difference that is, we, we, now we tend to 
to say that we have to produce more in order to feed these 821 million people that are not um, getting enough calories um, to live a, a healthy life. That's crazy. The, there is a lot that can be done through the better distribution of income, wealth, and, and food, if you wish, not distributing food in the streets um, that can solve this problem, right? Um, so we can actually get to 2050 without having to produce 50% more than we did in 2015, like we were predicting as a FAO, right? We can do much, we can go there with much less production, feed more people, and have a more sustainable agriculture. Um, and so I think that's the and, the, and the last thing, certainly food waste uh, is an important issue. Um, uh, food waste in consumption and food losses in the post-production stage, right? It's, it's something to be addressed. Uh, it's not going to solve the problem by itself, but it is, and it has increased during COVID because of the transportation issues. Our monitoring of the of the countries bi-weekly says that they have quite a bit of increase in, in, uh, in food losses. Um, and also because people overbuy, they just also, there is quite a bit of, um, of food waste over. Okay, thank you very much, Costa. And uh, so I, I would like to, to ask all of us to close this. So I, I think it is, and I would like to thank all those people who participated through Zoom and through Facebook and through YouTube. And uh, thank you very much for your questions. I think the overall conclusion is uh, what I took from, uh, from uh, your very wise words, all four of you, is that uh, the food system is, uh, is, uh, is resilient. It's going to, uh, it has really uh, done well, even during the crisis, and it will do well. The other thing, I think a message that comes is that the, the food system in, overall is going to, to, to solve this double problem of both the environment, be, like with sustainability being sustainable and also produce food. So it's going to contribute to climate, it's going to contribute to the environment. So, so this brings, I, I think, and that is uh, the, the other issue. I, I, I really like how this whole discussion uh, turned into a question of equality and distribution of income because it's on the consumption side uh, uh you know the consumer side that it is it is it is it is uh, very important and we cannot see it unrelated to 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 the food but also we should not forget the farmers i think uh, i think farmers have been and are the heroes of all this because they are on the field they're producing and um and i, I and i hope they will be remunerated uh, accordingly but um, I would like to close uh, here. I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank uh, Joan. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tassos in Brussels. Thank you, Costa. I think we lost uh, David. Thank you very much, David. And thank you, uh, Costas' uh, dog uh, who has been around. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thanks. Yep.